again, I want to thank everybody from Congregation Box Jones for being, for hosting this, uh, the, the people, the ladies who put together the food and everything. That was just it's spectacular. And just, yeah, it's just, Charlene's over there. She was one of the chief instigators of that. <laughs> Did a great job. Did a great job. Um, as far as um, getting, uh, as far as what uh, Hatikva Ministries is doing, uh, I, I've said something about it earlier, but um, Joe does a, um, uh, a Havara, a, a study, every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, uh, Central Time, obviously. And what you need to do is just go to Hatikva Ministries' Facebook page, and there's a drop down, it's called, I think it's Live is what it's called. Somebody's here. Um, it, and it's the videos, and it, it'll be there. It starts, sometimes it's, it's a minute or two late, so be patient. But it's for two hours. It's great teaching. It's like what we're hearing today, right? And you're teaching on the Mishnah right now, Mishnah and Talmud, how to use the Mishnah. So, good. Yeah, great. So, um, and I really want to thank Edgar. I don't know where he's at right now. But he came over from Austin to teach. And his, what he taught on uh, earlier, I think, just I've heard so many people talk about how suddenly he kind of started putting pieces together. And it just amplified what Joe talked about last night. And it's going to just continue on as far as the importance of the temple in our service and in our lives, right? Um, but I did want to make sure that you knew that, that on Tuesday nights you can, <clears throat> you can hear Joe also um, on the live broadcast. And then, um, oh, if anybody's interested, if you want to leave an offering for Hatikva Ministries, there's a Zadika box up at the front. It's down there by the, the table that will have the uh, books and everything that we'll, we'll, uh, you'll be able to see tomorrow. And, uh, you know, if you want to buy a book or a tape or a CD or uh, you had the thumb drives, um, we'll sell those tomorrow. There's, all, like I said, there's a Zotica box. If you want to make a contribution, make it to Hatikva Ministries. And if you can't find the Zotica box or whatever, you can give it to me and I'll make sure Joe gets it. <clears throat> um, we have Spanish translation. I don't know if anybody needs it today. Uh, but we are we did want to make sure that we were we could do that if anybody um, just really needed to have uh, uh, the Spanish translation and not uh, from uh, from the English. Huh? No, just here in this room. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah, just kind of a uh, just kind of a thing. We found out um, we had 64 people live streaming this last night. So we had a good group of people that are, that are attending this. Um, and also I know that, uh, you know, people, from, I saw Georgia, Florida, Arizona. The man who posted the live stream is in Oklahoma. So we have uh, people all over the place have been watching this and have been paying attention to this. And it's great because they know that you're going to get good teaching. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the main things. I know we're kind of still doing some downtime. I don't have too many jokes to tell. But <laughs> oh, schedule, schedule. Okay. Tomorrow, I'll do the schedule. Right, today, right now we're going to do Kadasha. Tomorrow, we start at 9 o'clock. It's going to be a virtual temple, or the tour of the temple. It'll be kind of like what we did earlier. Um, he'll go into more detail as far as different, you know, moving through the temple, different important areas and important things that go on in different areas. Um, then Edgar's going to do uh, Mamadot and Mishmadot. Those are the what the oh okay. The the virtual temples at nine to ten thirty. Uh, then eleven to twelve thirty is Mishmadot and Mamadot by Edgar. We'll have a lunch break. And then um, at 1.30 is New Discoveries. Yeah, bring your own lunch. Yeah, and um, yeah, bring your own lunch. And I guess, uh, yes. yes, okay. 
Yeah, and then at three o'clock, then we'll have a Sukkot in the temple by Edgar. So, um, and then uh, we'll wrap it up at 4.30 and we'll have questions and answers then. Um, so yeah, uh, 4.30 is questions and answers tomorrow. So it's a full day, but it's, it's great stuff. And for some of you that maybe came a little bit later, um, earlier today uh, during a break, we did this virtual reality, uh, which we actually have the 3D goggles. And they've got two, two sets of those back there. Um, and I did that, and it is exceptionally cool. It is crazy cool. And what we're going to do is it's not on the schedule, but we're during the lunch hour tomorrow. Um, we can have people kind of funnel through, and you know, because you only can do two at a time anyway. Um, so that'll be, you know, people can kind of funnel through and do that. I think if you want to do that during the lunch break, I think we'll try to set that up. Is that the guys that are doing the 3D? Are they on board with that schedule doing that? Who, who's the the 3D goggle guys? They're, they're okay, kind of. They kind of have to manage that for us because you got the buttons and all that. Okay, so. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, because yeah, they're they're going to make a special point to stay for the lunch hour so they can manage those three D goggles for you, and so I absolutely recommend you get in, get in line to do that because I did that today and it was, it, I don't know. Does anybody in here do like a three D goggle video game thing? Okay, none of you. If you did that, then it probably would be boring because I guess if you do those three D ga video games, maybe it's not impressive. But man, it was it was really, it was way more cool than I would expected. Speaking of more cool than I expected, you are way more cool than I expected. So, uh, I really have enjoyed this, by the way. Everything, everything you're saying is very riveting. So, are, we're up, uh, we're, are we up? We're up. You can see the title here. It's blank. Uh, let's see. It's Kedusha in the Beit HaMikdash. Okay. So, what does Kedusha mean? Okay. Uh, holy sanctified, any of these various things. Um, and the temple, uh, of course, is called Beit Hamikdash. And you see, if you just spell from English, uh, where we have Hamikdash, the K-D-A-S-H comes from Kadosh. Okay, and everybody should know what uh, the uh, Kadosh means. Okay. So, I thought... I knew what Kedusha was. I thought I knew what holiness was. And I found out that I didn't. Uh, I read a book. I mentioned this last night. It's uh, by, um, uh, I can't remember the rabbi's name. Um, I'll bring it with me tomorrow. But it's uh, the, the Holy Temple. It's meaning for today, uh, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Okay? Um, in the first chapter in his book on the Beit HaMikdash is what is Kedusha? And like I said, what, give me a definition. What does holy mean? What does that mean? Set apart. Set apart. That's half a definition. That's the part. I, I had the first half, but I didn't have the second half. How many times did you didn't get all the memo? Okay? And if you don't get all the memo, you're lost. All right. So I want to go through. Uh, we have God is holy. Everybody agree with that? Absolutely. God is Hashem is holy. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Shemot 15, 11. The Lord God has sworn by his Kedusha, by his holiness, well, now, let's, uh, let's go forward here just a moment. I have a question. And let, let's take this. In the book of Bereshit, Genesis, how many times do you think the word holy is used? In any form, any fashion, okay? The word holy meaning their Kedusha. I'm not talking about Kadesh Barnea. Okay, because we don't even have that. Yeah, we do. Kadesh Barnez is in Bereshit 14. Uh, but how many times does the word holy use the word in the book of Bereshit? 700 we have. Anybody else? 
50. Anybody else? One time. <laughs> One time. The Shabbat. That's it. We do not have it mentioned again until we get to Shemot chapter 3, Moshe, at the burning bush. Take off your shoes. Take off your sandals because the ground that you stand on is Atmat Kadosh, holy ground. Now, let's talk about people. What man, okay? And, and here, when I say man, we could say man or woman. What individual do we have in the Tanakh that is called holy more than any other individual? Take you, give me your best shot. Who? Moshe. Okay. Abraham. We're getting some good ones. Huh? Enoch. Somebody's got to give David, okay? Huh? Aaron. Nope. Not old Moshe, no, never, never. David, no, Abraham, no, Noah, none of them. Not one man is ever called holy. I mean, no. Listen, I used to say comments, there goes a holy man of God. And we have one scripture that is translated in English. You remember, this is for the prophet Elisha. And uh, the woman, her, her son has collapsed. And she said, here comes the holy man of God. Yeah. You know, in Hebrew, it says something different. Here comes the man of the holy God. Oh. Big difference. Big difference. Let me ask you, was man, did man, does man have Kedusha? No. We do not have Kedusha. We do not, did men ever have Kedusha? Yes, of course he did. Man was created in the image of God. And until man sinned, we had Kedusha. Not that we merited Kedusha, but it's something, if we were in the image of Hashem, and Hashem had Kedusha. But not only did we lose with the sin, our Kedusha, we lost the concept of it. And it means more than to be just set apart. Okay, I used to make statements about, you know, uh, this is a holy work. Or this is a holy building. We cannot make something kadosh. Only God can make something kadosh. Okay? So, hey, let me ask you. Holy temple? Holy temple. Temple is, uh, in the land of Israel, you have three locations that are called holy. One is the holy temple. One, <coughs> excuse me, is the, the cave of Machpelah, where Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov are buried. And the third is at near Jericho, at the valley of Achan, where the angel of the Lord tells Yehoshua, Joshua, take off your shoes, for the ground you stand on is Kadosh Admat, holy ground. Okay? But we cannot make something holy. Only God can make something holy. And you, you have to realize, for me, I had all these things. I thought, wow, I, you know, there were a lot of holy men of God. I thought, hey, 700 times maybe in the book of Bray Sheet, we have holy. And I found out I didn't know anything. But because man had Kedusha, man lost Kedusha, and man did not understand Kedusha, we have the temple, which is the house of Kedusha. Okay? All right. So, all right. All right. Uh, the use of Kedusha in reference to individuals. Noah, that's Noah, is called Ish Zadik, a righteous man. Moshe is called Ish Elohim, the arm of uh, a man. Caleb is Avdi, my servant. Shmuel, uh, Shmuel, Naaman, faithful or loyal to God. We have in the books, uh, 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 the book of Tehillim, uh, Psalms, we have men that are described as azadic, righteous, hasib, pious, yashar, straight in the paths of God. Ohev Torah, a lover of Torah. 
None are called Kadosh. This is the passage, uh, 2 Kings 4, 9. And she said to her husband, look now, I know that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. But you see the bold Ish Elohim Kadosh. It translates a man of the holy God. It's absence from the patriarchal record. In fact, the word Kadosh or any derivative is only used one time in Bereshit. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all its work which God had created and made. Now this, um, this is the other half of the definition. And you want to get this down. Okay? It is an examination of the mundane entities termed Kadosh in the Bible also reveals that they are set aside or designated as well. They're all set apart for the service of God by formal legal restrictions and limitations. Okay? It's not just set apart, but by formal legal restrictions. Why are we not selling our materials tonight? Because it's Shabbat. And it, it, ha it is holy. We don't sell on Shabbat. Okay? Shabbat is not a day that we mow our grass or wash our car or any of these things because it is set apart by formal legal restrictions. During Hag Hamatzah, you do not eat Hametz, leaven, because of its Kedusha. On Yom Kippur, you do not eat we fast, we afflict our soul because of its Kedusha. Now, not only do we have Kedusha on times, we also have Kedusha on uh, jobs or on people as groups like non-Jews can only go so far in the temple because they cannot go to that higher level of Kedusha. Now, understand Higher levels of Kedusha do not mean one is more righteous than another. All right? So Kedusha is not going to teach us on righteousness, but it teaches us very important things about approaching Hashem. All right? The Kedusha periods of time, such as the Shabbat and the Hagim. Everybody know what the Hagim are? That's your festivals. Are marked by limits on man's activities of work, and construction. Ties. Okay, so ties. What were ties in the temple? First off, where did you tithe? Did you tithe if you lived in Babylon? No. If you lived in Egypt, did you tithe? No. Why? Because what? Tithing is in the land of Israel only. Okay? And that's in the Torah. In the land of Israel is where you tithe. What did they tithe? Animals and produce. Animals and produce. Well, let's talk about tithing. Okay? So tithing is a... Tithing is... Uh, is there a time you tithe? There's a tithing season. What? No, the tithe is from the month of Saban to the month of Tishri. And it's in Chronicles. Yes? No. Because what you tithe, the, the agriculture that you tithe is going to be the Shiva Mandin the seven species, okay? But here's, here's, here's something big. I mean, this is big, and I'm not trying. Please, <coughs> uh, I, I'm going to tell you everything that I'm going to hit you with that will hit you like a ton of bricks. I got the ton of bricks first, okay? So I'm not trying. This isn't a vindictive thing, okay? But here, we, you hear all kinds of messages about tithing, and yet... What we find out is most people don't know much about it. 
Why? Because they didn't study the temple because it would have defined it for them. Okay? All right. So tithes, uh, oh, yeah, the tithing season would be in the book of Chronicles. I, I probably have it up here. It'll probably come up. Uh, the uh, objects endowed with Kedush are prescribed from use in mundane purposes. From Saban to Tishri. Yeah, from Saban to Tishri. Basically from Shavuot to through Sukkot. Yes. Uh huh. Yes, and he'll come up in here. Now, right, the Nazir, the one who is a Nazir, is uh, set apart because of his vow. It doesn't make the individual. The na a, a Nazir is holy. That position, like a Kohen Gadol, a high priest, is a has kedusha, but Aaron himself did not have kedusha. Okay? So Paul did not, as a Nazir, have Kedusha. But the fact of being a Nazir does have Kedusha. It sounds confusing, but it's... He is. He is, but we don't call him as an individual holy. He is separated to God, and he is in a state of holiness. It's like when the Kohen Gadol puts on the garments, okay? When he puts on those garments, he has Kedusha. But the moment he takes off the garments, he doesn't have Kedusha. In other words, the office is Kadosh. Yes. Right. That's it. And the Nazir is a state of Kedusha, but the individual doesn't have personal Kedusha. That's my argument on administration. There we go. All right. All right. Kohanim. Everybody know what the Kohanim is. That's a priest. May not come into contact with the corpse, and they're restricted in choice of spouse. They cannot marry just anybody they want. All right? The people of Israel called Am Kadosh, a holy people. However, and this is over a dozen times in the Torah alone, we have this term, but in every single instance, it is followed with a call for Israel to observe the commandments. Legal restrictions. All right? So, and that's going to be Leviticus 19.2, Leviticus 11.45, <laughs> Deuteronomy 14, 21, and Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. All right. The Kohanim, uh, the uh, genealogical status and manifest through the restrictions that apply to all Kohanim. Nazir, Bamabar 6, 8, number 6, 8. It is the restrictions of the Nazir that set him apart. All right, so uh, why is it that the entities dedicated to the service of God bear restriction and limitation? Mikre Kodesh. Okay, so occasions of Kedusha. All right, so now I'm going to depart from my slides for a moment. We have during the week. Uh, of the festivals. We have the Shlosh Regale, and that's your three pilgrimage festivals. Okay? And so we have um, the first day, uh, we have Hakamatsa. The day they kill the Passover lamb is not actually a hog, but it is an appointed time. All right? So the first day, it says it's a Mikre Kodesh. A holy convocation. Now there's three terms that are going to mean the same thing. They're interchangeable terms. So the three terms, Mikre Kodesh, a Shabbaton, High Sabbath, or 
Yom Tov. Yom Tov literally translates a good day. Okay? However, what it means is a day of Kedusha. All right? So you have Sabbath re restrictions that apply to a Yom Tov. Except you are allowed to cook. You cannot cook on the Shabbat. You can't. Uh, so you are allowed to cook. What are you allowed to cook? Microwave. No, not microwave. <laughs> Never. We can't. Not microwave. On. <laughs> we gotta. We gotta store it over here. All right. Now, what? What? Uh, what are you allowed to cook on a Yom Tov? Okay? Can you make peach cobbler? Uh, can you make... Hey, uh, let, me, let me make it simple. You're allowed to cook for the festival. You're allowed to cook for the festival, but that's all. You cannot cook for anything else. Yes? Uh, can you boil it? Yeah, you can boil it. It, it depends. It, there might be restrictions, like, for instance, the Passover lamb. You cannot boil that. All right? So there might be restrictions that say, no, you can't. But uh, otherwise, you're allowed to cook however you want. All right. So uh, in the temple, I'm, I'm kind of getting away from my PowerPoint here, but I want to explain uh, to for you to see something. Now, we have a Yom Tov is the first day. So the 15th of Nisan is a Yom Tov. It's a Shabbaton and a Mikre Kodesh. So you are going to have certain things you cannot do and other things that you must do. Now, what, because it's a Shabbat, you can't go to work. You cannot plow your field. You cannot wash your car. You cannot do any of those things on the Yom Tov. All right? The next day is not a Yom Tov. Just the 15th and the 21st are going to be the holy days, the Shabbaton. So what you call the other days in between are Hol HaMoed. Last night we talked about the word Hol, remember? That is LeHamadvil Ben Kodesh LeHol. Okay, it means common. And then we have in the temple, we have the holy area which is Kadosh, the Azarah, and then we have the Kel, which comes from the word Hol. All right? So we have these two terms. We have Holy Day, and that means restrictions, and then we have the intermediate days, the common days of the festival. Now, if it's Hag Hamatzah, it doesn't mean on the intermediate days you can go out and have a bunch of Hamats, leaven. You still have that restriction. But you don't have the Sabbath restrictions. You can go to work. You can do all of those things. And then we have another. All right. So, uh, at Passover, when the temple was standing, when the temple was standing, they are going to kill the lambs in the afternoon of the 14th. And they're divided in three groups. So when will it become the 15th? When will it become the Yom Tov? When? At sunset, when it gets dark. And what we're told in Pesachim, the tractate of the Mishnah that deals with the slaughtering of the Passover lambs, how it was done, what we're told is that the first group comes in, we find out that they are going to enter at 2.30 in the afternoon approximately, and they are going to kill their lambs, and then they are going to exit, and they go out on Hor Habayat. Everybody know what Hor Habayat is? That means the Temple Mount. They're out within the 500 cubits by 500 cubits. Now, the second group goes in, and they kill their lambs, and they exit, and they are going to stand on the kel. Okay, so that's on the exterior of the inner courtyards, but they are on the hell. The third group, which is the smallest, they go in and they kill their lambs, and they come, uh, they, 
when they finish, they have to stay in the Azara. Nobody can go to their places that they're eating their meal until it's dark. So it's dark means what day are we on? Which is a Yom Tov. And they have to take the lamb and they have to cook the lamb, right? So the lamb, they are cooking the lamb on the high Sabbath. They're forced to cook the lamb on the high Sabbath. In the Passover meal, when do we eat the meal? In the middle. People say, why can't we eat it the first? Because there is a tabdit. We have to eat it in the middle because that's when they ate it in the middle. Why? Why, did, why was it left to go from this point to that point before they brought the lamb in? Because God teaches us his plans through the literal top meat. So when you start to mess up, no, our people get hungry. We want to have it at the first. Then you're going to miss the message. And the Seder is divided into two parts. One part deals with actually the first coming of the Messiah, while the second part deals with the second coming. And now you just changed the plan. You put in your own way, and you lost the message from God. Okay? That's why it's important that we have the Kedusha, that it teaches us, because it keeps us, as Edgar was saying, on the straight. Okay. All right. We have uh, the Shabbat festivals, Kadosh objects, tithes, first fruits, carbonate, may be eaten only by certain people in prescribed locations and for limited periods of time. We have the restri we have uh, restrictions in diet, kashrut. We have sexual relationships. Um, I'm going to go through this part fairly fast. The time, space, and objects that are limited to us through the agency of Kedusha are signs that God's covenantal partners, we must relinquish some control in every sphere of our existence and reserve those elements for service. That is a hard thing for Americans. We, my wife and I, we, we joke about this uh, some, quite a bit. Uh, people don't like restrictions. Uh, what is Frank Sinatra, his most famous song? I did it my way. You don't want that before God. You want to do it his way. And so... The, but people do not like the restrictions. Now, I'm not talking about making restrictions. What I'm talking about is what we'll see is the restrictions, okay? Those you won't, because God always has a reason and a purpose, okay? But we don't like to relinquish control. Look at this one. This is from Isaiah 58. Now, we're going to look at it carefully. If you turn away your foot from the Shabbat, what does that mean? If you turn away your foot from the Shabbat. Okay? Uh, uh, the, to turn away your foot, your, the emphasis should be on the word your. In other words, what you want to do is you want to turn away your foot. You don't want to be setting your path. If you turn away your foot from the Shabbat, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Shabbat a delight, the word is oneg here, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Let me talk about that part. On Shabbat, are you allowed to work? No. Are you allowed to talk about work? No. 
That's working. If you're talking about the job I have to do, you're actually doing that job. Okay? And talking about the job you did, you're still in it. Shabbat is to be an island of time. What's that? No cell phones. Oh, well, that'll kill people. Okay? No cell phones, no texting. Okay? Uh, years ago, I have this real good friend. And, in fact, this is how I met Edgar. Um, Edgar, you know, lived in Austin and everything. And we had this uh, rabbi come to our office from Jerusalem. And uh, his name is uh, Rabbi Avraham Greenbaum. He's a Bratislava rabbi. Ultra-Orthodox, okay? Black coat, black hat, beard down the hair. Uh, and, uh, but R Rabbi Greenbaum, he's really a great rabbi. He's a very good teacher. We really respect him, okay? And um, Edgar came over to, to, to hear him speak, and uh, I asked him, you know, where if he was driving back home. Because when I found out he... He was from Austin, and he said, yeah, he was going to do that. And I, asked, I, I made him come to my house. And we became friends. But anyway, Rabbi Greenbaum uh, had come back, and he wasn't speaking at my office, but he was speaking over in, uh, actually, in not, uh, yeah, in East Houston. Uh, and he was in a hotel, and we all went up to the hotel and we got rooms and stayed there and everything. And so when there was a little break, this was on Friday evening, I came to Rabbi Greenbaum and I said, Rabbi, uh, where uh, where did you come from? And he shook me away. And I knew immediately. I was asking him to come off the island. Okay? So later on, when I have this good friend, um, he was there, and uh, he came up to me, and he said, Joe, I, I made a mistake with the rabbi. I said, what did you do? And he said, I went to him and said, Rabbi, where do you go from here? And he shook me away, okay? But uh, the thing is that what we talk about on Shabbat is God. We spend that time with him because it's set apart. Now people want to talk movies, and they want to talk, talk. Uh, they want to talk movies. They want to talk sports, and lately they want to talk about vaccines, and they want to talk about dirty politics and false news, or what do they call it? Uh, fake, news. fake news. Fake news. Okay, those are not Shabbat topics, and it's hard. It's difficult to stay on that island. But once you master that, at least to a degree, then all of a sudden you find out what Shabbat's about. Then you find out this whole world of Shabbat and where God can teach you and instruct you and show you things you never saw, never even you were there. And it says, Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Yaakov, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's Kedusha. So we have hierarchies of Kedusha. In other words, the Kohen Gadol bears a higher level of Kedusha than do the other Kohenim. But the higher you go, the more restrictions you have. Okay? So it doesn't mean that you're a better person. It has, has nothing to do with that. We have Yom Kippur. has a higher level of Kedusha than the other festivals. Uh, speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Shabbat you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Shabbat, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death, for whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Shabbat of rest, says the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Shabbat day, 
he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Shabbat, to observe the Shabbat throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. This is Veshamru. Uh, is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. And when he had made an end of speaking with him on Mount Sinai, he gave Moshe two tablets of the testimony, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. First Kings chapter 8. This is the uh, Sol uh, Solomon's dedication to the temple. So the Lord fulfilled his word which he spoke and have filled, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. I have built a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I made a place for the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. You shall, by the way, these two are equal. The Shabbat and the temple in Kedusha. You shall keep my Shabbat and reverence my Mikdash, my temple. I am the Lord. They are word for word the same. We have that twice. All right. This is important. This is from the Mishnah, from the tractate Kelim. Okay, so Kelim means vessels. This is going to be in chapter 1, and we start in Mishnah 6. Okay, so we have 10. I'm going to paraphrase it a little. There are 10 levels of sanctity. The land of Israel, Eretz Israel, is more sanctified than any of the other lands. It has a higher Kedusha. Now, in each case, they will give how that you know it. Okay, so that uh, what is its sanctity? What is its Kedusha? From the Torah, that we may bring from it the omer. In other words, the barley that must be weighed before the Lord is by Torah law has to come from the land of Israel. You cannot get it from any other country. Uh, you, we may bring from it the omer and the shiva menim, the seven first fruits, and the shtei halakam, the two loaves of bread, the wheat, that, uh, the two loaves of bread that are going to be waved at Shavuot. They ha that wheat has to be grown in the land of Israel. That is a biblical requirement. Therefore, from that, they have Israel has a higher Kedusha. Okay? Uh, the second, cities, meaning cities within the land of Israel. And I'm, I'm going to amplify it a little bit more. Surrounded by a wall, or more sanctified than this. Let me give you an example. Tiberias, today, there is an old part of the city that has a wall around it. It is not higher in Kedusha than a city without a wall. Because the wall has to date from the time of the conquest of the land by Joshua. Okay? So Jericho, which doesn't have a wall today has a higher Kedusha than Tiberias, Tel Aviv, any of these places. All right? Understand, it doesn't mean it's a better city. It has a higher level of Kedusha. Okay, there's a reason. Cities surrounded by a wall are more sanctified than this, for we send the Metzorim out of it. Okay, so what is a Metzorah? means that he has biblical leprosy. Yes, sir. Well, the city is there. But it's not in the same place, right? Yeah, it is. It's in the same place. The ruins of Jericho are at the city of Jericho today. What's that? Yeah. 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 And, but you don't want to go there. Yeah. It's not a nice place. Uh, okay, so the Amatsura, that you have to expel the Amatsura out of the walled cities. Okay? That means one with sarap, biblical leprosy. Biblical leprosy is not the leprosy that you see on uh, movies and things. Psoriasis is a form of, of sarat. Okay, there's numbers of different skin ailments and so forth 
that are going to be in the category of sarat. All right. We have also that they may carry a dead body around within the walls until they decide. Meaning, okay, let's say back here is a city. By Torah law, we can walk around inside the city with that dead body for as long as we want. But the moment that we step out the gate, we cannot go back in. Now, how much are you allowed to step out of the gate? Half a net spa. That means half a finger breadth. Okay? So you are not allowed, yeah, like this. In other words, and that is in the Torah that you may not, once you have taken the body out. Now, nobody's going, they, they actually bury within 24 hours. Okay? And so, uh, may carry a dead body around with them until they decide once out, they may not bring it back. All right. Within the walls. This is Kelim 1.8. Now, here, you have to know a little bit of the background. You uh, look and get an art scroll or Kahati Mishnah where it kind of gives you the background. Within the walls, we're talking about Jerusalem right now is more sanctified than these. For there, for we may eat their Kodashim Kalim. Anybody know what that is? That means holy offerings, like the peace offering, the thank offering, the Torah offering, the first fruit offering. Okay, so they have to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Where could you eat a Passover lamb? within the walls of Jerusalem. All right? So uh, you've heard of Bethesda, right? Bethesda is a suburb of Jerusalem. Now let's say right here, this is real good, let's say this is the wall of the city. Okay? I'm inside Jerusalem. Out here, this is Bethesda. Now if I, if I could lean over and the guy was really tall, I could hand him a note. We're that close to each other. But I could eat the Passover lamb here. He can't have it here. Because you have to be within the walls of the city. Because of its Kedusha. Are y'all you, are you following me? Now, Yeshua is going to be slain and resurrected in 30 common era. So 10 years after that, King Agrippa II is going to build a new wall around Jerusalem. It's called the Third Wall. And it comes out here and it encompasses Bethesda. So, if in the time of Paul, after 40 common era, could you eat a Passover lamb out here? Yes. As long as you're within the wall. All right, are y'all understanding? I hope that you realized already, I got to understand Kedusha. Okay? That it is something that God placed tremendous importance on. All right. We have Maser Sheni. What is that? Second tithe. Second tithe may be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, uh, Hor Habayat. Well, I've told you what Hor Habayat is. What is that? The, the, uh, the house, uh, the mountain of the house. That is the Temple Mount. Hor Habayat is more sanctified than this, more sanctified than Jerusalem. Okay, even though it's in Jerusalem, it has a higher Kedusha. For Zavim, okay, so Zavim, these are males that have a genital discharge. Whoop. What happened? All right. It, uh, I'll go ahead and explain why it's doing. So Zavim uh, may not enter the Temple Mount. Zavot, women that have a discharge of blood outside their menstrual flow. We read about it in three of the Gospels. The woman that had issue of blood for 12 years. She, she is a... She is a Zava, a Zava, 
The plural is zavot. Okay, we got to go. Let me get back here. Okay, the next one it says nidot. Women in their menstrual flow cannot go on the Temple Mount. And yoladot, here we are, that was it. Yoladot are going to be women that have a discharge due to childbirth. Okay? They cannot go on the Temple Mount just because they have impurities. All right, so you see zavin, zavot, nidot, and yoladot may not enter there. The hell. Now, it's not H-E-L-L, okay? It is actually spelled with a C, C-H-E-I-L. The Kel is the common area. It has a higher Kedusha than Hor Habayat. Okay? So what we're doing is the higher that we go in Kedusha, notice the closer we're getting to the throne of God. Ah, but the closer you get to the throne of God, the more restrictions you have. Last night I asked you, if you had Morty's time machine and you went back to God and in, and uh, Adam and Hava had just come out, would you go in? I wouldn't, because I know I can't stand before the holiness of God. It will destroy me. But God is going to teach us through the temple He's going to teach us how to approach Him. Right up to the very concept of going right into His throne like the high priest does on Yom Kippur. All right. Isn't this exciting? To me, I, it's real ex I get all excited. Okay. <laughs> the hell is more sanctified than this for Gentiles, weren't, one rendered impure by a corpse, may not enter there. Uh, Ezra Nashim, court of the women. Ezra Nashim is more sanctified than this for a tuvulyom may not enter there. So let's, exp let's exp uh, discuss what a tuvulyom is. All right, what does yom mean? Day. All right, so you know the blessing for washing hands? Natilat yadayim is how it ends. Okay, natilat. What do we call, what is the Hebrew name of Yochanan the Immerser? Hamatvil, okay? Uh, what do we call the uh, immersion? Uh, the, what is a mikvah called in Hebrew? The building. Beit HaTevila. All right? So to wash is the word tevila. All right? So a tubal yom is one that is impure for that day, and he must immerse. So he has to immerse, go to a mikvah and immerse, and wait for the sun to set, and now he's pure. Okay? So a tubal yom uh, may not enter there. In other words, he cannot enter into the Ezra Nashim, the court of the women. Uh, but they're not liable to a sin offering for it. By the way, we talked about this last night. Being impure doesn't mean someone has sinned. It can mean that, but it doesn't mean that literally. Okay? So uh, Yeshua became impure numbers of times because in dealing with the people, like the woman that had the issue of blood, contact with her, she grabbed the hem of his garment, that made him impure. And by the way, it was a tubuyom. Okay? All right. So, we have... Uh, now, we're going to go up from the court of the women. We have 15 steps. And then we're going to enter through the Nicanor Gate. And now we're in the Azara. Now, it gets... We're really getting close. Okay, so Azrat Israel, The court of Israel. Now, Azrat Israel is only 11 cubits wide. Let me ask you this. How big is a cubit? All right. I have several of you going from the elbow to the fingertips. Right? 19 inch. Whose arm? 
Then it's a myth that it's from the elbow to the fingertip. How many cubits are there? Well, in the temple alone, we have three. We have three different cubits. Okay, what is the smallest size that a cubit can be? 14 inches. 14 inches, the smallest cubit that's ever been found. This is one of the reasons that the temple cannot be down at the city of David. You have a cubit less than six inches. It makes your court of Israel just about from here to there. You can't do it. You have thousands, millions of people, literally, that are going to be there. It won't work. Okay. Now, we have in the temple, we have what is called the outer court has uh, 500 cubits by 500 cubits. It is 20.67 inches. It's called the royal cubit. And we have in the court of the women, we have a five handbreadths cubit. It's 19.2 inches. In the Azariah, we have a six handbreadths cubit, uh, which is 23.04 inches. Okay? <coughs> Edgar can give you the meters. All right. We have Ezra the Israel, court of Israel, is more sanctified than this, for one lacking atonement may not enter, and they are liable to a sin offering for it. So, can a man of, that a Jewish man, can he just go into the court of Israel? No. It is a ceremonial courtyard. It is a ceremonial courtyard, and only certain groups are going to be able to be up there. Okay? So, uh, Ezra Kohanim, the court of the priests, is more sanctified than this, for Israelites may enter there for only at a time when they're needed. For laying hands. What does laying hands mean? Smicha. Okay? And the laying of hands. Where, are they, where do you lay hands? On uh, where? The head. Where? On the head. Top front. Not the back. Not the side. Top. Okay? I lost again. Okay? For laying hands. Uh, for, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, here. Uh, they are needed for laying hands, for slaughtering. Who slaughters, when you bring an offering, who slaughters it? You do. You do. Now, if you didn't know what to do, the Kohanim would slaughter it for you, or you could bring a relative that knows what to do. But we have the rightly dividing the Word of God. It comes from correctly dividing the carbon note. All right? So, uh, for heaving, it's also called wave offerings. So how are wave offerings done? Is it where they all go, Hey, look at me. I'm waving at you. Okay, what is a wave offering? Okay, no, it's not this. It is what is called tenufa. Tenufa. Okay, so tenufa is always done the same. How many, how many immersions do we have? Ah, oh, there's about 15. Lots of immersions, okay? And, you know, there is one immersion into Messiah, but if you go into Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about the doctrine of immersions, plural. Now, what makes a difference between an, a, a woman that, has, that is married, that has had her menstrual flow, will go and immerse following that, okay? What is different from that than someone that is going to immerse that's coming to Jerusalem for a festival? What is different? They do it exactly the same. So the process is the same. What's different is what's called the Kudusha Pei. They pronounce what they're doing. They can have to state what they're doing. Okay? And so the uh, Tanufa, we have wave offerings all over the place. And Tanufa is always done the same. So this way is east, right? Okay, so if you were in the temple, you would not face east. We face east because we're facing the temple. 
But if you were in Jerusalem, you would face toward the temple. If you were on the temple, you would face west towards the Holy of Holies. Now, you're going to wave, and what you do is you will wave three times before you, three times to the right, three times behind you, three times to the left, and three times to heaven, and three times to earth. So that's Tanufa. What you're doing is Tanufa. Okay, so non-Jews, they are allowed to enter the Ezra Koanim for this purpose. All right, let's go to the next one. Rabbi Yossi said, in five ways between the ulam, the porch, and the altar, corresponds to the hekal. Okay, now the hekal means the temple building. All right, those with a blemish, those with wild hair. Have ever, anybody ever heard of wild hair? That doesn't mean had hair. Okay? In the scriptures, we're told in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Ezekiel that Koine may not have wild hair. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where it says a man praying with his head covered, people take it, oh, that means a hat or a kippah. Check it out. It doesn't say that at all. What it says, a man praying hanging down. It is the Greek words for the Hebrew wild hair. Okay, so why can't women go into the inner courtyard? No. Women can't go in because in the pagan temples, the women that go in are prostitutes. And God honors the women. He says, not in my temple. Why can't you drink wine and go into the inner courtyard? Because in the pagan temples, you become drunk. Okay, so one of the things, it, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Corinth. At Corinth, you have Delphi. Delphi, do you know anything about the priests and priestesses of Delphi? Okay, the male priests dressed as women, and they had long hair, and they were homosexuals. And the women had their hair cut off, short, and it was dishonored to their heads, and they were homosexuals. And God says, not in my temple. And so the wild hair, the covering there, the whole thing, it's not about hats and coverings and so forth. It's about this whole complex of that. That's what it's dealing with. Okay? But we have those with wild hair, those who had drunk wine, and one who had not washed hands and feet may not enter there. Every one of those has a death penalty. May not enter there. And they must withdraw from between the ulam and the altar at the time of the burning of the incense. Between the ulam and the altar is more sanctified than this. For those with the blemish and those with wild hair may not enter there. The hekal is more sanctified than this. Now, the hekal is going to be specifically the hakodesh room. That's where your menorah, your shulchan lakam hapanim, the table of the bread of the face, and the mizbeach katorat, the altar of incense is. Uh, the hakal is more sanctified than this, for one may not enter there without washing hands and feet. And only kohenim can go in there. The holy of holies is more sanctified than these, for only the kohen gadol may enter there on Yom Kippur, and the last few words of that, at the time of service. If he goes in and is not at the right time of the service, it's just as if he did it on a different day. Okay? So understand that Kedusha always has restrictions and limitations. But it has everything to deal with how coming closer and closer to God himself. All right. Uh, we've talked about this, be my mikdash, that they'll make me a mikdash, a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Uh, we talked about the tavnit. And it says, according to all that I show you, that is the tavnit, blueprint. You can't change it. You can't add to it. You cannot take away from it. And the tavnit of all its furnishings, and then here you have the and. Let me see if I can do 
All right, you can't see it, but you see the big red in the Hebrew? You see the big red letter? That's the and. And that makes it a continuing tense to every generation. This command applies to us as much as it applied to the people in the land at, at the time in the wilderness. We already saw this last night where we have that he, let's just look at the, the top neat of the temple building, the top neat for all that he had by the Ruach came by the Spirit of God. A lot of people believe, oh, why should I follow a bunch of rabbis they put together this temple building? I want you to see in Scripture it tells us it wasn't put together by man. It was put together by the Spirit of God under God's direction. He did not allow them to change it. They did not have that right. All right? So for all that he had by the, the rock of the courts of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around it, of the treasures of the house of God, and the treasures for the dedicated thing, also for the division of the priest and the Levites. So the priests were divided into how many portions? Groups. Twenty-four. How about the Leviim? Take a guess. Seven. No. Stay with where you were. 24, 24, 24 groups of the Levi'im, 24 groups of the, uh, the Kohanim, and how many districts was Israel divided into? Good guess, 24, okay? The Kohanim are the priest, and then the tribe of Levi, okay? So every... Every Kohen, every priest is a Levite, but not every Levite is a priest. Okay? You have to be from the family of Aaron to be a priest. But we have also that the, uh, that the uh, districts are going to send to Jerusalem a delegation every week. They're called the Ma'amad. Okay? So the Ma'amad... Remember when, uh, when Edgar told you about the word amud? Yeah. Okay, it means a column, that you're to be a column before God. We say the amida. We stand, okay? So the ma'amad comes, these are the standing men. Now, you've read about them. So let me, let, uh, Victor's going to talk about this tomorrow, the ma, uh, how all this works. Yes, he is. Oh, Agar. <laughs> yeah, I, get a, I just got it. I don't know why I have Victor on my mind there. All right. So at any rate, uh, but he's going to talk about this. You're going to see this. We're told, uh, how many times did a coin get to burn incense? Once. Very good. Yeah, Agar, Agar, not Victor. And, and I, we have a rule. You can't forget anything we say. Okay? You have to remember everything. All right. So, um, uh, you, how many times you, can you burn incense? Once in your life. Okay? But when, what was uh, when the angel Gabriel came uh, to Zechariah, who is the father of Yochanan Hamatville? What was he doing? He was burning incense. So this was the first, it had to be the greatest day of his life. Okay? He's the closest that he'll ever come to the throne of God. All right? Now, when, when he burns incense, by the way, when was he in the temple? Do you, can you tell me? No? No? It says that he was in the temple according to the, to the time of his division. All right? And so you're told that he's of the division of Avia, which is the eighth division, which means that he was in the temple the tenth week of the year because we have to add the week when all the Kohanim have to be there for Hakamatzah and the week of Shavuot. So we're able to calculate the exact time that the, that the priest, Zechariah, uh, was burning incense in the temple. Now, God gave you that detail because there was a purpose in it. What was he praying as 
he is burning incense. Ah, no. He's, uh, well, yes, but no. They are not allowed to pray whatever they want because it could bring disaster. What they're praying, and while they're praying it outside, the Ma'amad are praying exactly the same thing. And it's called the Amidah. And specifically, I can tell you, based upon what we have in the book of Luke, I can tell you even which Amidah he was on. Because when Gabriel, excuse me, when Zechariah opens his mouth, when he, at the Brit Milah, the circumcision of Yochanan Hamatvil, he makes a, a statement in the first verse that deals with the season of Pesach. But he makes a statement in the second verse, which is the first three words of the twelfth Amidah and the last three words. And that is rabbinic shorthand. Okay? Isn't that amazing? But what's amazing is you don't catch it because you never looked at this stuff. You say, that's all just a bunch of rabbinics or that's a bunch of Jewish whatever. And yet, what you should be able to see is that this is something that God gave for us to be able to understand what is there. All right. So, uh-huh. Okay. Both. Yeah, be both. Yeah. Yeah. The twelfth. What's that? Today's twelve is not that twelve. Yeah, it is. It's today. No, no. Today's twelve. They added one. Yeah, they did add one, but they divided another one. But it's twelve one. Now. Yeah. It, 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 let me say that it is the twelfth Amidah that we do today. Let me that's let me correct right. it. Right, and that's not the original. Right. Let me get to. Uh, let's see, Shepherdy for weekdays. Well, All right. Yeah. And then the last few words, you need to know what the Amidah is to be able to figure yeah, it out. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Let me read this to you. All right. Next page. All right. In Hebrew, it says, Esabak David Abdeka, Mehara, Tazmiak, Bekarin, Torum, Be Yeshoteka, Kile Yeshoteka, Kevinu, Ko Hayom, Baruch, Ata Ereshim, Matzmiak, Korean Yeshua. Okay, so it may the Samak, Samak is, it means branch, it is the primary term for the Messiah that we have in the Tanakh. Okay, may the Samak, of your servant David, soon flower. Okay? At Samak David of Deca. Okay? And may his, and here in English it says pride, but it's horn. Horn. And may his horn be raised by your salvation, for we wait for your salvation all day. Bless are you, Lord, who makes the glory of uh, the, uh, the, glo the horn of salvation flourish. All right, let me read this to you. And then I got to get back to my thing here. Okay, so in Luke, by the way, the whole story of Yeshua's birth, when you see it through the eyes of the temple, it's totally different from what you've seen before. Okay, don't take anything away, it just adds a few volumes. All right. Uh, all right. 
when Zechariah opens his mouth and it's, he speaks, you know, he was mute and deaf, okay? Bless us, Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Okay, that is a Passover statement. It's because they have come. And has raised up a Korean Yeshua, horn of salvation for us in his, the house of his servant David. That is a reversal of what we have in the Amidah. And I guarantee you that, and that is the prayer for the coming Messiah. And that is the prayer that the angel Gabriel is standing and says, your prayer is answered. Okay? And that right there, that should make this conference alone worth it. Okay? Okay? So, uh, all right. So let me take on. Uh, they shall teach my people the difference between. Ah, uh, this is the highest calling of the Kohanim. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common. Hamadvil ben Kodesh lechol. You can see ben Kodesh lechol. Okay, uh, and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. All right, we have within the within. The uh, Horhabite is the Chel. Uh, Tenemot and 12 steps were there. This is coming from the east. Chol, here's your word, Chol, like Chol, common. Chel, Chel, the common area of the Azra. Now you were already told it had a higher Kedusha than the outer court. And it had a higher Kedusha than Jerusalem, and it had a higher Kedusha than walled cities, and a higher Kedusha than the land of Israel. Okay? But it is, it has a lower Kedusha. It's the common era of the Azariah. This is where we're getting really close to the throne of God. All right. We have to have that. So, rules of the Azariah. No one except a king descended from David may sit in the Azra. We talked about this last night. No one may turn their back on the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And we have an, ex an exemption, the Kohenim that do the Aaronic blessing, and now we know the Levitical choir. All right? No male may have his head uncovered within the Azra. And uh, I believe, Edgar mentioned this earlier, that if you go to the Kotel, you, you have to have your head covered. You have to have your shoulders covered and so forth. Uh, there was basically a death penalty if a male appeared on the Temple Mount with his head uncovered. And the priest, it was such to an extent that the priest had to have his head covered when they are going to choose the lots. Well, the way they do, you know that the priest has a headgear. Okay? So... What he's going to do, do you have a kippah on underneath? No. Okay. We're going to say he has a kippah on underneath. This is his thing. They, the priest wore kippot. That's where they originated from. How do we know this? We know this from the documents on the, the Kohen Gadol, because, the high priest, because it tells us that his kippah was tekelet, unlike the other Kohenim. All right? So it's not something that there's all kinds of stories out there about where this came from and everything. But when the Kohen Gadol, excuse me, when the Hamanune, the administrator of the temple, there are 15 of these guys, they're going to choose the priest for their jobs. The way it's done is he stands in a circle. Uh, excuse me, he stands in the middle of a circle. All the Kohenim from that Mishmar are going to surround him. Okay, so he, God gives him a number. He is going to take off the, the turban of one of the Kohenim. Now, that, he, has to, he has a kippah on underneath. Because if he doesn't, there is a death penalty. All right, so he tells the Kohenim, pick up one finger or two. They cannot pick up a thumb. Now, each of the core names, so hold, uh, hold up a finger. One, hold up either one or two. All right? So I got one. Hold up one or two. All right? So the number, let's say the number is... Uh, 13. Yeah. 
13. Well, you see there, he would count till he got to 13. And that's the priest that God chose. Is that two, four? Like yeah. And when you're told that, let, let me show you this. And it, was, it says in Zechariah, uh, in Luke, let me, re let me read this to you, blow you away. It says, the, but they had no child because Elisheba was buried. And so it was while he was serving his Kohen before God in the order of his Mishmor, the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. So it wasn't just random that it happened. God chose him. It was an appointed time. Okay? No, it's not like rolling dice. It's where the God chooses the guy for the job. All right? All right. No food may, may be eaten within the Azarah. There's no toilets in the Azarah. Priestly garments must stay in the Azarah. How many of you have seen movies with them out in the, uh, in the wilderness chasing Yochanan and Hamathil and they, we have these priests or they're, they're in, make way for the priests, make way for the high priest and then you see them in the markets of Jerusalem. Read it. It's there in your Tanakh. It says they cannot go out of the Azarah. They can't even go into the court of the women in priestly garments. So, why? Because of their Kedusha. You'll find it in Ezekiel 44. So read it for yourself. All right. The chamber is built in the holy part. This is Maser Sheni. Out of the Mishnah is 3.8. Now Maser Sheni means second type. But the chambers built in the holy part. Okay, that's your Azra. And opening into the non-holy. That's the hell. Their interior is non-holy, but their roofs are holy. All right? Built in the non-holy and opening into the holy, their interior is holy, but their roofs are non-holy. Don't even try to figure that out. <laughs> not today. Do figure it out, but not today. Okay? The next, what we want is the next sentence. It's where it's built in the holy and the non-holy. Okay? And opening into the holy and the non-holy. Let me read something to you. I'm going to read to you out of the Mishnah, out of the tractate Midot. Midot means measurements, measurements of the temple. All right. All right, this is Midot 1.5. It's talking about the gates in the north. It just described in the previous mission of the gates in the south. And those in the north, Shor Hanitzot, it means the gate of the spark, was a sort of oxadra, a portico, with a balcony and aliyah built over it so that the Kohanim were guard from above and the Levites from below. And... It had an opening to the hell. So that means that this building, it opens into the Azara. And it opens into the hell. Second to it, Shor HaKorban. Third to it, Beit HaMoket. Let me go to the next mission. Actually, let me say, yeah. Beit HaMoket. This is the, means chamber of the hearth. This is the dormitory for the priest. We have a problem. The priests are going to stay overnight in the temple. Their mishmar is on duty for a week. We have to have a place where they can sleep. They are required to eat the carbonate, and they have to eat it in a place that has the kadusha. All right? So, what we're going to have, picture this. Here's the Azara over here. And then we have a gate, and it opens to the Azara. That means this building has the Kedusha. Now over here, this is the hell. And this building goes all the way. It's built from there to here. And so it opens to the Azra and it opens to the hell. 
Now, in this case, that means that the entire building has the kedusha of the Azara. But in the end that opens to the Kel, we can put a marker called a Rashi Pispasin. And in that section of the building, even it's not going to change the Kedusha, but in this section of the building, they can sit down. They can have a bed and lay down. And we're told this is where the ovens were for them to cook those carbonate. And we're told in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 44, that this is where, uh, excuse me, chapter 42, this is where they ate them. Everything that I'm telling you is biblical, okay? Everything is biblical, but that's exactly how the temple worked. But you, and let me read the rest of this. It says, there were four chambers in Beit HaMoket, like side rooms opening to a drawing room, two in the sanctified area. That means they're down at the area. If, if you, the side that opens up to the Azarah, you have the same rules as Azarah. Okay, two in the sanctified area and two in the unsanctified area. One that opened to the hill. And the ends of beams, and that's going to be in Hebrew, Rashi Pispasim, that means Kedusha markers. It's more it's changing, it's telling them the Kedusha has changed. All right? Separated the sanctified area from the unsanctified area. What was their function? The southwestern one was the chamber of the sacrificial lamps. That's in the most holy part. That's where the two, the six lambs that they're going to keep, they're going to take one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and slaughter for the daily tamid. Okay, they are in, in fact, uh, the south, let's see, uh, the southeastern one was the chamber of the makers of the lechem hapanim. That's where they bake the showbread. And that's in the most holy section. But the northeastern one, in it the Hasmonean stored the stones of the altar. Now we're told in the tractate Tamid that that's called the Lishkat Hotmot, the chamber of the tokens. So if you came up to the royal stoa and you have to buy flour and wine and oil, they give you tokens, you come over here, you give the tokens to them, and they're going to have, when you go to you have your, your offering done, they'll have your flour, wine, oil, and everything you need. Okay? And the last is... Uh, the northwestern one. This is important. Through it, they would descend to the place of immersion, the Beit HaTebila. All right? So there is an underground mikvah chamber. I read this to you last night. Y'all didn't forget, did you? Can't forget anything. Okay? We had a chair of dignity. Do you remember that? What's a chair of dignity? A toilet. Yeah, and if he knocked and no, and no one was there, okay? Y'all remember? Yeah, right. Okay? All right. So, that, let, let me, let's, let's face it. I don't care who you are, you've got to have a toilet. <laughs> okay? That becomes imperative somewhere during the day. All right? So, uh, they have to have a way that they're not breaking the Kedusha to be able to go to the toilet. And we we located the toilets where they were, okay, for the Kohanim, but they go through an underground tunnel to it, and we know where they are. We understand how the whole system works now, okay? So, by the way, a lot of this is going to be in my book on Measure the Pattern. All this is discussed. All right. Here, let me show you. I can't show you. See where it says Beit HaMokad? That's the building we were just reading about. Look down at the bottom on the right-hand side. That's the Beit HaNitzot that we read about it also. Over here, the Beit of Tinnus, that's where the Sanhedrin sat. That's where the Kohen the Gadol, the high priest, had his chambers. Okay? And back up here, that's the Beit HaOtzerod, or the storehouse building. And in the first temple, that was called the Beit Ya'er HaLebanon, the house of the forest of Lebanon. All right. Uh, here, we already read this, so we don't have to read that. Y'all caught it? Okay, caught that one. This one is very interesting. This is what's called the trumpeting stone. 
And they found the trumpeting stone. Let me show you where they found it. Right? Uh, okay. It, at the southwestern corner of the Temple Mount, up on top, they, this is where the trumpeting stone was. Now, they actually found the stones. Look, look can you see? And you can see how they're, the poor, they're at the top. Can you see those? And look here. This... Right? I, I, my, can you see uh, in the stone, there's a big crack coming down. And if you look closely, you can see Hebrew written in it. And it says, to the house of the trumpeting. And they have figured out what the rest of it says. Because we're told in the Mishnah, in Suk the Sukkah chapter 5. Okay? The tractate on the festival of Sukkot. And to separate between the holy and the common. The house of the trumpeting, and uh, we're told what time when they blew the trumpets from this location. Let me see if I can show you here. This area, we have this in our app, by the way. Uh, these stones weigh uh, about seven, eight tons, and they were found. Let me see if I've got that here. Now that's a sorag. All right. Uh, Let's go back up. I'm going to show you where they were. No, I can't show you here. Let me go forward. They were found at the southwestern edge, uh, excuse me, southeastern edge of the Temple Mount. Okay? They were found by Charles no. Southwestern. Yeah, southwestern edge of the Temple Mount. They were for, found in the 1870s. Oh, I, excuse me. I'm telling it wrong. Charles Warren. Charles Warren uh, was part of what was called the Palestine Exploration Fund. They were allowed to come from Britain, and they were allowed to chart the water systems on the Temple Mount. England, a, a very rich lady in England, was going to give the city of Jerusalem a whole new water system based on the condition that royal engineers could survey the existing water system, and the majority of the water system at that time was on the Temple Mount. So Charles Wilson, Captain Charles Wilson, Captain Charles Warren, Lieutenant Claude Condor, and a Swiss-German architect that lived in Jerusalem named Conrad Schick were allowed to go up and chart and do, uh, examine and everything. However, they could not dig. They could not dig on the Temple Mount. Warren, you might have heard of Warren's Gate, Warren's Shaft. These are all famous things. Charles Warren was also came back. He was the, uh, the, uh, the head of the British, uh, excuse me, the London Police Force. He was the commissioner. Of the, of the London police force, and he was in charge of the Jack the Ripper exam, uh, examination. You see him in movies. At any rate, Charles Warren sank a shaft at this southwestern corner. When the uh, 1967... That's not Warren's shaft. No, that's not Warren's shaft. That's in the city of David. He sank shafts all over around the edge of the Temple Mount. Uh, the, um, in 1967, the, the Six Day War, the, they got the Temple Mount back. It was returned back to the Muslims. But they were already, before the war was over, making plans for doing excavations. They were originally going to do the Temple Mount until it was turned back. But they made a plan to do the southern steps and uh, Professor Benjamin Mazar from Hebrew University was the head of the dig. When they got down and they got down to the bottom of the southwestern corner, they found these stones. And they found the trumpeting stone. Okay, this stone right here. That is the original trumpeting stone. All right. It had been broken 
when Warren sank his shaft, he used dynamite. And they never found the other part of the, the, the text. But we have descriptions of it. Okay? But this is the house of the trumpet blowing to separate between the Kadosh, Bain, Lechol, the, the holy and the common. And it was blown before the Shabbat to tell people to get ready. It was blown uh, different times. So what I want you to see is Kedusha in action. Here, there were never less than 21 tikot blasts in the temple, not more than 48. Each day, 21 blasts in the temple, three for the opening of the gates, nine for the daily morning uh, offering, nine for the daily afternoon offering, and during the Musaf uh, offering services, they would add another nine. On the eve of Shabbat, six additional would be blown. Three to signal the people to cease working, and three to mark the boundary between the sacred and the profane. Lehamadvil ben Kodesh lehol. Okay? And it goes on. Uh, so this is where, here you see it. And that's, you see that cutout? That's where the coin would stand the blow. Josephus talks about it. And it's one of the proofs that this is the Temple Mount. Is that the cockrow? No. But when there's a possibility that the cockrow, you're not allowed to have poultry in Jerusalem when the temple stands. Okay? So if you don't have poultry, you don't have roosters. All right? So what is a giver is the word for males. You can check the men's restroom here. It has giver on it, all right? But it also means roosters. It also means crier. Okay? So in the temple, the crier in the temple has a threefold cry. Edgar mentioned it earlier. The Kohenim to the 12 Malot, to the 12 steps. Leviim to the Dukan, the platform for the Levitical choir. And Ma'amad to your post. That's the threefold cry. And so, uh, the, uh, again, we come back to the temple to understand the crucifixion of Yeshua. Here is a Sareg stone. The hell is more sanctified than this for Gentiles, one rendered in pure by a corpse, may not enter there. Oop. All right, this is the, uh, this one. This is an Istanbul museum. And it's 19.2 inches. If you remember, that is a five handbreadths cubit. And uh, this, by the way, both of these were found by explorers from the Palestine Exploration Fund. This is a partial stone but it's word for word exactly like the full one. And it's exactly like what Josephus uh, uh, recorded. Uh, this was the first enclosure, this is from Jewish antiquities, in the midst of which it was, and not far from it, was the second to be gone up to by a few steps. This was surrounded by a stone wall for a partition, which uh, with an inscription which forbade any foreigner to go in, uh, go in under pain of death. All right, that one's in the Israel Museum. So this, uh, I can't, all right. So you see uh, where the word Soreg is. That's a flat area, that's the hell. Okay, so we have steps uh, in front of it. So the sereg, everybody knows what the sereg is. That's where the signs are. And so our Kedusha is going to change here. So if you don't have, if, you don't, if you're restricted, you can't go there. Now, the steps, we're told in Midod, they are coming from the east. There were 12 steps up to the hell. But in Josephus, coming from the south, there were 14 steps up to the hell. Why would they have different numbers of steps? Oh, I can tell all of you live in Houston. Uh, right, it's a mountain. And so you have different elevations. So you have different number of steps. On the western side, there were no steps. Okay, so it, it dealt with the terrain of the mountain, how many steps. 
Now, this is important. This one, we are on the, uh, I'm going to say it could be the south or the north. It really doesn't matter. Um, but I'm going to say it's the south. So this would be Bait of Tinnus, right here where you see these gold gates. Now, Bait of Tinnus is a corner building. All right? At the end of the corner building, you see that it goes in. This is going to be described by Josephus. I can't show it to you. Okay? It goes in, so we're going to have a plaza leading up to what we call the middle gates. Right. On the other side, we have a corner building. It's going to be duplicated on the northern side. All right. So you have corner buildings, and you enter directly from the hill into them. All right. Here's the serag. See how it looks like a net? All right. And so uh, the uh, I already talked to you about the czar. Okay, that means the outsider. We don't need to look at this. Here is a Kedusha mark, a Rashi Pispasim. Okay, so uh, there you're able to see it. We're not exactly sure how these Rashi Pispasim looked, but we're, there are several different ideas, and, you know, one day the one will show up. We'll figure it out. Uh, we've already looked at this Mishnah. Let's see. Y'all have got the general idea. Now let me see if I can show you any more pictures. Pictures are always good. Yeah. Hey, why did we have two high priests at the time of, of uh, David? Yeah. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> Mom? No, but that's close. Okay? We had, remember, uh, Eli over at Shiloh. And Eli's sons, they got killed at Afak, and the Holy Ark was stolen, taken to the Philistines. It didn't work out so well for the Philistines. They get rid of it. It goes to the Beit Shemesh. David's going to move it, but David messes up in moving it because there's rules of how it can be moved. And so it causes Uzzah to lose his life. He's a good guy. He tries to steady the Ark, but you can't touch the Ark because of its Kedusha. And so they have to set up a tent at Kiryat Yarim in order to house the ark. Well, the rest of the Mishkan is at Gibeon. So we have two high priests, one with the ark and one with the Mishkan. All right? So why is they for 20 years in Kiryat Yarim? He's afraid to move it. It's going to stay there until they know it's all of he messed up big time when he moved. And then he moves it to Jerusalem, and it's not a Gibeon. Uh, it's going to go to Jerusalem, and it's called the Ohel David. Okay, so let's see. Here, this is an older, uh, we now have a building uh, behind the uh, temple. It's called the Parbar. Uh, we now know what the middle areas, middle gates are. We just discovered this in the last year, uh, what uh, those areas are. Uh, let me go forward. That's it. Okay. Thank you all. Uh, is it question and answer time? What's that? Is it question and Q&A time? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. Before we get too late. Um, I have, I'm going to do the first question. Hey. Uh, okay. I got the mic. Um, and it takes a little bit of setup, so yeah, be okay. patient with me a little bit here. Um, yeah, I was, I was concerned about that because we're not prepared to do Hobdala here, so, right? Um, I don't know why we can't do that, so it's, it's something to be concerned about. Um, so, I'm going to read from my NASB. Uh, excuse me for that. I'm going to read the book of Ezra. Uh, and then the book of Ezra, chapter 3, yeah, verse 12. Yet many of the priests, the Levites, and the head followers of the, house, of the households, the old men who had seen the first temple, wept with a loud voice 
when the foundation of this house, the second temple, uh, was laid before their eyes. And then if we go over to Haggai, Haggai okay, I'm glad. You probably got, you got an answer to this. This is what I want to hear. Uh, if you go over to Haggai, it says in, in chapter 2, verse 3, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in comparison? And so basically this is a description of the second temple that was built here in, and it's recorded in Scripture. And they talk about how small, unimpressive, pathetic it was looking. Well, that doesn't sound like anything like what we've been looking at here today. And I had um, a guy was debating I don't know, something online a while ago, and um, I kind of always thought that, well, I know Herod you know, expanded the temple, so I kind of figured, well, this temple that's here, that's described here, they must have built a, a building around it, and it's inside there. Um, that's kind of what I thought. And I had a guy basically tell me that, no, what, what you see in the time of Yeshua, he called the third temple. No. He, call, he called it the third temple. And I was immediately offended by that. I'm like, wait a minute, no, it's the second temple. There's no third temple. And so I started doing a little more research into this. And um, I'll give you time to correct me if I'm wrong, because I can't remember where I actually had this, the source from. I think it might have been some of it from Josephus Antiquities or other, other places, and I can't remember where I got this description. But the description that I remember reading about was that around 10 to 20 B.C., Herod decided he wanted to rebuild the temple. And the priest said, no, you're not. And they didn't trust that he would rebuild the temple if he dismantled the one that was described here. And, and but what Herod did to get over that distrust is he went and had all the stones for the new temple quarried and smoothed and polished and everything and brought to the site. And it was ready there to go. And once he did that, the priest believed that he was going to actually rebuild it if they were to dismantle it. The dismantling was all done by the, the Levim, the, the Levites. So they trained up the Levites to do this. So it wasn't destroyed like in, you know, by enemy. And the Levites, I assume they still had to do the sacrifice, but I don't know. Um, and the Levites, as I understand, agreed to do this. So they dismantled the old temple that we read about here, and they rebuilt with Herod's stones, uh, the temple, which is much closer, at least on the inner part that we see here. And then he continued to expand court after court after court, and he got this huge complex. And in fact, as I understand it, he was still expanding in the area, uh, even at 70 AD when it was finally destroyed. So that's a long setup, I know. Um, but my question, or my comment is, question, I guess, what I have described, do you understand that to be substantially accurate to the way it happened, number one? And number two, do you assign or, or have any meaning for that being yeah. a possible third temple? Or how does that okay, it, it's, it, first off, it's considered the second temple. The reason it's called, uh, considered the second temple is there's a continuity. From the time that they inaugurate, in your passage in Ezra chapter 3, verse 6, it says, from the seventh month and the first day they begin to offer offerings. And the foundation that the, 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 the altar was built, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. Now, uh, your passage in Haggai, it occurs on the 24th day of Elul, which is seven days before that. Um, if we go back to, let me ask you, uh, when Solomon built the temple, did he build the whole temple? No. It took 200 years to build the whole temple. The reason it took 200 years is because it was a mountain, and they had to build up the uh, build it up by levels, and that took years. Uh, it is believed that it's in the 8th century BCE. Solomon is in the 10th century BCE, during the time of uh, Hezekiah, or Hezekiah. Now, you probably know the song in English, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. This is the first time that we have the expression Hor Habayat. Now, Josephus tells us that, um, that Solomon built the minimum which allowed them to get the services started. And that he built basically one wall, and then later kings came in and they completed it. And so you can check this out for yourself. Um, 
Same thing with the second temple. Ezra, when they laid the foundation, what they're going to lay is the minimal. In other words, what do we have to have in order to get the service going? Now, basically, they have an altar. Once they have an altar, they can start doing the offerings. And that, this is contingent upon first having a red heifer. You have to have the, for a seven-day ceremony of the ashes of the red heifer before they can do anything. But then, after that, people have said, oh, all they have to build is an altar, and then they can stop. They can't. They have a continuing commandment to build the temple of the Lord. Now, what happened in the second temple? Ezra built enough for them to get started. The people cried because it was so much smaller than what it was at the time that the first temple was destroyed. But over the next uh, 150 years or so, they are going to build more and more and more. We get all the way up to the time of Shimon Hasmonee. Shimon Hasmonee, yes, Debbie? The same dimensions. Yes, it has to follow the same it had, dimensions. It had to have the same dimensions, it just was not in its fullness yet. Right. Here. This is a Sidor. Okay, so Eger uh, took you through Pesuke de Zamra, the verses of praise. We don't have to do Pesuke de Zamra, the total thing. There is a minimal part that we are required to do, certain prayers that we're required to do. And generally, if you go to the most orthodox of congregations, they will not do all of the Pesuke de Zimra because there wouldn't be any time to do anything else. And, and that the temple and the services are not to be the only thing you do. You're to live. But you're to be where they, in your living, everything's before God. Okay, so there is minimal that you have to have for the temple. And so once, but they keep building. When Shimon has Benet, okay, so we're going to, y'all know who Judah Maccabee is. Okay, he, he's the guy that gets the temple back. But he gets killed. His brother Yochanan is going to take his place. He gets killed. His brother Yonatan takes his place. He gets killed. The last and the fourth brother is Shimon Hasmone. Shimon Hasmone becomes the high priest and he makes himself prince, Nasi. He rebuild, he is going to enlarge and beautify the temple. We call that the Hasmonean temple, but it's still second temple. Then when Herod comes along, Herod is going to build the third section or the third uh, Sagma, our third uh, phase of the second temple. He will start the construction. And what you said before, he had to buy all the materials and get them all there. However, we don't think he got them all. He got enough for the inner courtyard. Okay, and the temple, Herod is going to die in 4 BCE. Herod's, uh, the temple will still be under construction in 70 common era. They just in about the last three years discovered that the western wall, Herod had been dead for years when the western wall was built. They found coins at three locations. One is going to be at Wilson's Arch. Uh, uh, there are two mikvahod that will be found uh, that are Hasmonean mikvot that are under the corners of the southwestern foundations. And they found inside them coins that are dated from about 20 common era. And so they know that, that Herod was dead by that time, but it was still called Herod's temple, Herod's wall, because he's the one that planned it. Uh, but so the, the second temple did as prophesied in Haggai, it did exceed the first temple eventually, but not at its beginning. And the, the third temple will exceed that. When we, when we build the uh, first phase of the third temple, we have to build it according to the tabnit of the last temple. Okay? Herod's temple. 
We're working to discover that. But I can guarantee you, it is not going to be the majesty of Herod's temple. It's going to be the minimal of Herod's temple at first. Okay? Right, and right now, how many of you have seen the priestly garments they're making? They have several hundred. Do you think that's enough to, to clothe all the koanim? No, not at all. They have harps. They have enough for a minimal service to get started. Now, what they're expecting is that once they have the temple mount, once they start, their people are going to contribute like crazy to it. And so they will be able to very quickly get other things done. They'll have more weavers. They will have more, you know, of everything, but they're not going to have it at first. And so I hope that helped. Basically, that's the answer. Uh, yeah. That was a, yeah. That was a yeah. lengthy answer to a lengthy question, so it's understandable. <laughs> um, anybody else have questions? Please use the mic here because uh, there's people online that need to hear the question. Hmm? Well, yeah, uh, I don't know. We probably don't have time to do that. We're about running out of time anyway. But. Are we going to have all gold for the third temple? Ah. Gold for the third temple. Well, yeah, actually, that was going to be one of my comments. Yeah, I can actually, I can envision that when the temple is initiated or really started, that Jews and Messianics and even Christians around the world are just going to pour gold on that place. Well, I imagine that place so. Is going to be swimming in gold, I believe. I imagine so. There was a tremendous amount of gold in the temple. It's controversial where the outside of the temple was in gold. Um, the, there's a statement in Josephus. There are contradictory statements in Josephus on this. Josephus said that uh, the exterior had gold plates. Another place he says that the exterior was white stones. And that the white stones, it describes the stones. About eight years ago, uh, about eight years ago, uh, a stone was found uh, underneath the Temple Mount by Eli Shukron. Okay, so Eli Shukron is a very famous archaeologist. And um, uh, the stone is called the White Stone. It is a stone, um, a stone of the temple is called an ashlar. It means a large building stone. And there are two ports to an ashlar. In what is called the uh, the frame and the boss. Okay, so picture um, a um, let me see. None of these pictures have a frame around them. But yeah, it would be opposite this though. Oh, up here. Okay. So the boss is going to actually be a cutaway. I, I, excuse me, the, the margin. It is cut away uh, going around the pitcher. Okay? So it makes a frame where it is cut away maybe this much. Then you have a raised portion in the middle. That's called a boss. What's that, Debbie? Come up here and show me. It's, it's, where, it's where you have a frame like this that's flat, and then you have a little part that sticks up. The old kind are, are a lot bigger in the middle and a lot more uneven. Yeah. At the time of Herod, it's going to be, you know, very, very thin. So, yeah, you have... Um, so if oh, wait, 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 look. Thank, uh, okay, thank you, Gabriel. All right, here, you see, look at the Herodian finished boss. See how that it, um, it is, um, uh, it makes a frame around it, okay? So that's the margin. And then the boss is the extended area. Based on how big the boss is, they're able to date it 
from the Herodian period or Hasmonean period to Persian period. The Persian period means like Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, and so the stone that was found, the white stone by Eli Shukron, had no boss. It didn't have a margin, but it was a white and it is wavy. Okay? So in other words, it had a slight pattern in it that you could see. Now, so we have a description by Josephus. There is another description that is from the Talmud. When we put the two together, it describes the stone Eli Shukron found. They believed that it was a stone that was made for the original temple building, or the, the, the Herodian, and that possibly Elat Mazar felt maybe it had a flaw in it, so they couldn't use it. Okay, so they put it in the foundation. Elishukron, he had another theory that whenever you go to build something, you get extra materials. So that if you run out or you run into a flaw in a stone, you've got some, and this was left over. Whatever the case, they believe it's uh, one of the stones from the temple. If that's the case, then the outside of the temple probably did not have gold. However, there was gold everywhere else. There was gold, you have all kinds of golden pictures, there are golden plates, there are all kinds of things. Yes, sir? Uh, I was in Thailand, and the golden Buddha is basically painted gold sheeting. Ah. Would they use gold sheeting uh, paint? Yeah, I, they yes. The, you know the Mizbeak Katarat, that's the altar of incense is made of shittim wood. Okay, shittim wood is acacia wood. All right? The, it is painted with a gold paint. And, I mean, it's not like golden color. The paint is gold. And so, but, but that is an example. The shokhan lakam hapanim, the, the table of the bread of the face. And there are two... Uh, you have these these frames coming up on the side. They are, it's shittim wood covered with gold. The Aron Kodesh, the Holy Ark. I, that is, I, that might be gold plating itself. I'm not positive, I have to check that. But it is shittim wood. And uh, the copperet for sure is made from a piece of gold because the caravim, the angels on top, they have to be, they're, they're one piece. It's all one piece. It's not like something that's painted over a frame. Yeah, the, the Mishkan, the, yes. the tent of meeting, had the, the boards, and the boards were overlaid with gold. Yeah, and right. I think I remember when Solomon built the temple, he put inside the temple, didn't he put uh, cedar boards that were also overlaid with gold. So the yes. whole wall would be and what, They're not and painted. They are going to be overlaid. Yeah, it's overlaid with, and I think you're, that kind of shows up in your uh, your virtual reality yeah. tour thing, right? Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Wait, wait. They're, they're going to bring your mic. Oh, okay. Thank you. I thought that believers were supposed to give 10% of their income, but not so. Oh, no, uh, let, me, let me be clear on this. Okay. When we teach on tithing, People frequently quit giving. Okay, that's not what we mean. All right, but the uh, uh, we are supposed to give, and you should give to where you're being fed. Okay, so should you support your congregation? Yes, but there is not a ten percent requirement for that, and tithing dealt with in the land of Israel. It dealt with agricultural, uh, uh, agricultural and animals, and only when the temple was standing. So, who did you give the tithe to? Levi. The Leviim. Okay, the and the Leviim took care of the widows, the orphans, and they took a tenth of that and gave to the Kohenim. Now, Tormot, which is also your seven species. 140th, 150th, or 160th, who was that given to? No, it's given directly to the Kohenim during the festival of Shavuot. 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, what he was been saying about the tithe is exactly what we basically teach about the tithe, and there's a reason for that. We both read what the Torah says. <laughs> yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> and, uh, but it's different than what you probably heard out there yeah. in the world, and I'll cover that in my class. if you. One of the things, a very powerful statement that I heard one time, is we're not going to get biblical results till we start calling things by their biblical terms. Amen. And so... Yeah, so it's not to say don't give, but don't call it tithing, okay? And, you know, the, the, you'll learn more about giving and all the various things. And so uh, I hope that helps. Okay? About eating the... The Passover meal within within the walls. Yes. So how does that apply to us today? Because number one, there is no walls, and we do this. You know, we 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 eat. Yeah, we so don't have a lamb. A lamb. You are not. You can't slaughter the animal anywhere except the temple, and the blood has to be applied to the altar. So we have a shank bone, which is a remembrance of the lamb on the plate. Okay. So, yeah. correct. In the current state of things in the diaspora that we're in right now, there are certain things that we cannot keep. And yep. does and many of those people outside these walls will say, well, then you should stop all of it. Don't keep Passover at all. Right? Well, no, we disagree with that. We keep the things that we can keep to the level that we can keep them. Right. Any more questions? I have a question. Where's Edgar? <laughs> huh? Oh, he's translating. Okay. I was going to say, why isn't he up here answering questions? <laughs> Thank you, Edgar, for translating. No, I'm just. Okay. No, that's fantastic. But we're doing that because we prepared for it, and it was something that we felt as, you know, Tina brought it up to me. We felt it was important that we did that. You all helped us out, your congregation. Uh, uh, um, uh, Louis um, and his son, I communicated with them, so we had it set up to do it, and I didn't even know we were doing it. What's that? Translating. That's what it Oh, yeah. Is. So that's fantastic. What? <laughs> so would you please solve the dispute on Temple and Temple Mount and the City of David because a lot of literature is this fear. That okay. We... Let, me, let me say this. Uh, the temple being down at the city of David will not work at all. It is impossible to work. Great. Did you hear that? Uh, <laughs> you say, don't talk about that. You know better than that. Here's, if, if you put the temple at the city of David, your cubit is less than six inches. Impo you can't do it. It will not work. Number two is it's built on the concept that the water for the temple comes from the Gihon Spring. The temple does not use the water from the Gihon Spring. It has its own water sources. Its water sources, by the way, I've had the opportunity to work with uh, some of the leading experts in Jerusalem on the ancient water system. Ronit Amiel uh, is a good friend of, uh, of ours that worked on it with us for a number of years. She was in charge of the, the Hezekiah's water tunnel and the Gihon Spring in the city of David. And I'm going to tell you, all of the water people, all of the archaeologists, including Eli Shukaron, say that the temple was up on the Temple Mount. Okay? I know Eli, and I've got a film of Eli saying it's on the Temple Mount. It cannot be at the city of David. In addition, they have found, and I've shown you already, the trumpeting stone. I can show you numbers of things that are described as being in the temple that uh, are found there. Here's a good question. They're saying that the, at the city of, excuse me, that the, what we call the Temple Mount was the Fortress Antonia. So why would the Romans need mikvaot? There are mikvaot in several locations. I showed you the one for the men and the one for the women. There is also one under the, what's called the Dishkat um, Hametzarim, the Chamber of the Lepers. 
And it's exactly where we're told in the Mishnah, it's in Tractate Negaim, it's exactly uh, where the Court of the Women is, and in that corner, the northwestern corner uh, of, the, uh, 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 of the Court of the Women is where the Lishkat Mimetzarim is located, or the Chamber of the Lepers, and right below it is where they found a mikvah. Okay? And so we have found the, uh, the, where the toilets were underneath. We found the tunnel system. We found everything that is described. I don't want to say everything. We're still finding new stuff all the time. But we know. We don't have 100 pieces of evidence. We have 10,000 pieces of evidence. I mean, it's all over the place. And let me tell you an exciting thing. You know, we live in a bad time, right? I think that COVID was horrible, all right? Uh, I, I lost a daughter. We, we have that the entire, our world's changed. And it'll never be the same. We have, do you think that the last elections were honest? I don't. What about all the shortages? <laughs> okay, but I mean, we live in a very bad time, and we see the war in the Ukraine. There was war just two weeks ago in Israel. We have threatening war with China and Taiwan. We, I mean, I don't have to go in and tell you how bad things are. We have a, an agenda of the, on, on television where... They're throwing homosexuality, transsexuals, and all kinds of things constantly at us and our children. And everything that we have that's going on in the schools of what's been done with the children. And I know that you know this. We see the evil happening in the world that was prophesied. But let me tell you, if you want to see the hand of God, look at the temple. Because we used to have where uh, I have been doing this for, for almost four decades. And God has opened the doors. I've worked with the leading rabbis on this. I'm, I am not all the archaeologists, but many of the archaeologists have worked with us and helped us. We've got a research team that is just unbelievable. Um, but we used to get a major discovery every few years. And then... Um, a few years ago, we started getting a major discovery about every year and a half. Right now, we're getting major discoveries about every few weeks. Because the, in the last days, knowledge will be increased. Some of that's for the bad. But the Spirit of God and the hand of God. And back in the 1990s, uh, there was only a handful of Jews that would go on the Temple Mount. Do you know, last week, I don't know the numbers, I think, the, huh? 2,000? 2,000 Jews were on the Temple Mount for Tisha B'Av. And, I mean, everything's changing, but it's the hand of God that's moving. And, listen, have uh, have y'all heard things that you haven't heard before that kind of explain things in the Scripture in what we've been talking about? Okay? God is going to bring the temple out where people see things they're not seeing before. He's doing a work among us. And so it's part of this last day setting that we're in. And so, you know, I want to tell you, it's not all bad. There is good and there is majesty before God that's being unfolded before us. Okay? okay. I mean, I'm, I'm speechless. I mean, I don't know how you guys are, but just hope to see you all at 9 o'clock in the morning. The, okay. Huh? Uh, the the um, table will be uncovered, and uh, books and tapes and everything that Joe has will be available. Again, if you want to contribute to Hatikva Ministries, if you write a check, make it to Hatikva Ministries. We've got a Zotica box up in the front by that table. 
you can give it to me. Um, and we'll make sure that, that, that Joe gets that as well. But, um, you know, this is such a blessing. And, and how, how to count, just to, to see how our lives function around how the temple works and how you move. You know, we've, we've been studying now all day. We've been hearing how you go from more and more and more holiness, more Kaddush, all the way up. And it's all the way we live. And how we can stop at any point along the way, but that's, that's not the goal that God has for us. God has us walking right up to the Holy of Holies. And uh, I'm, thank you all for being here. Again, I hope to see you in the morning at 9 o'clock. And uh, we're going to have a great day tomorrow. Amen. Amen.